From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents W.C. Fields and Anne Shirley in Poppy. Lux presents Hollywood. To the thousands of loyal listeners who wouldn't miss a Monday night with us, to the thousands of loyal women who insist on Lux Flakes, our grateful thanks. Your purchases of Lux Flakes make these programs possible. Our bill tonight is headed by W.C. Fields, Anne Shirley, John Payne, and Skeet Gallagher in Poppy. We'll also hear from Miss Margaret Graham of the Algae Barn Sells Floto Circus, who tells us of customs, costumes, and superstitions of the circus. Louis Silvers conducts our orchestra. And now, here's our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Between the ages of 11 and 15, Mr. W.C. Fields, born Claude William Dukenfield, never slept on a real bed. He spent his nights under stairways, in box crates, and doorways. Having no home, he'd become the idol of Philadelphia's other small boys. The toughest brats for miles around would seek him out for a fight. Fields never could refuse a challenge, and his bulbous nose is really a red badge of courage. It stands today as a radiant monument to the valor of its possessor and to the amazing accuracy of his opponent's fists. His fame as a juggler began with a $10 a week job at Atlantic City. Fields was part of a free entertainment, which the management staged to stimulate the sale of refreshments. When business was dull, he would wade into the surf, scream for help, and pretend to drown. Huge crowds would collect, and while the victim was being resuscitated, the refreshment business would flourish. It was not unusual for Mr. Fields to drown three or four times a day. <laughs> to this day, his character remains unchanged. He is still Fields against the world, a strange combination of cynicism and sentiment, of stern truth and honeyed prevarication. Mr. Fields starred in Dorothy Donnelly's stage play, Poppy, and also in the Paramount film from which comes our radio adaptation. His latest Paramount picture is the big broadcast of 1938, and we hear him tonight as Professor Eustace P. McGoggle. The title role will be played by that delightful young star, the versatile Anne Shirley. Anne is from RKO Studios, where her latest films are Law of the Underworld and Condemned Women. John Payne of Paramount Studios is Billy Farnsworth. Skeets Gallagher is heard as Whiffin. And we're off to the big show, as the Lux Radio Theater presents W.C. Fields and Anne Shirley in Poppy. fairgrounds on the outskirts of a tiny Indiana town in the year 1881. At the end of the midway on a rickety platform stands a bulbous-nosed gentleman known as the professor. In one hand he holds a decrepit banjo, in the other a quart bottle of purple bark sarsaparilla guaranteed. With his old top hat riding perilously on the bridge of his nose, he leans down to the crowd and addresses them in a rasping baritone. Uh, step right up, ladies and gentlemen, close to the platform. Step out of the gutter bar and let the water run. You'll hear absolutely free of charm. My charming daughter, Poppy, the flower of the song world. In a song recital, and I shall accompany her on that noble instrument, the Cadula Cadula. I thank you, I thank you. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce the most remarkable scientific discovery of marble modern times. Purple Park Sarsaparilla, one dollar a bottle. Four quarters, one smacker. Purple Park Sarsaparilla, ladies and gentlemen, one cure. Remedy for man, the beast, fish, and fowl. Grow hair on a billiard ball. Will it grow hair in a pool ball? Oh, but the eight ball. It's a fake. Oh, you impugn my honor. So that saw in a woman in half a fake. I saw her afterwards in a restaurant. Well, you astound me. I thought they were killing from eight to a dozen women a day. <laughs> Let me through here. Let me through. I want to see the man who sells that remedy. Ah, oh, that's fine. Let's lead through. How do you do? Lovely weather we're having. How many bottles? Quick. None. 
I bought one bottle of that bio stuff from you yesterday. Oh, so you did, so you did. And how's your Adam's apple today? <laughs> I've never had an Adam's apple. Oh, how unfortunate. You sold me this stuff for my dyspepsia. <clears throat> I spilled a little on the floor last night and my cat licked it up. And this morning, expect to eat it in your bulldog's eye. How interesting. He's dead. Overdose. He should have only taken a nip. Cat nip. That fire. medicine of yours killed him. Uh, just a moment. Step aside, young lady. Step aside. It cures hoarseness. Ladies and gentlemen, it cures hoarseness. It cures the most stubborn case of hoarseness. One little drop of this bottle, I can't take, will cure the most cunning grace of hoarseness. Oh. It cures horsemen! Sheriff, Sheriff, over this way. Yes, yes. Yes, over Dad, here. we better get out of here quick, Dad. Ah, uh, quiet, dear. It's snay I can pray. Sheriff, Sheriff! But she's getting the sheriff. Come on, Dad. He's only twitting, dear. Just have fun. I'll probably sell a bottle to the Gildersleeve. Where is he? Point him out. Look, Dad, she did get the sheriff. There he is, Sheriff. Hey, you. He's coming over here. Copy, my child. What, Dad? Take it on the lamb, my little fawn. The Bunyan steeple chases on. There they go. Ah, birds chirping in the trees. Flowers rearing their pretty little heads, shuffling their little feet and singing by mere vista of shade. Oh, Dad, look. <laughs> Do you mind if we stop walking for a while? I'm so tired. Oh, how thoughtless of me. Sit down, my little plum, and rest your pretty little bones. Here's a nice tin can for you. Sit on there. <sighs> Do you think we're safe here? Gee, Dad, I'm so hungry. Courage, my daughter, courage. The Green Meadow Carnival is just around the bend. What bend? Ah, you have me there. Look, look, here comes a wagon. Yeah. Gilpin's hurrying to the carnival. Yes, but they're riding and we're walking. Walking is good. Shorten the appetite. Here. <coughs> Chew on this piece of milkweed. It's full of calcium. Good for the teeth. Oh, no, thanks. Dad. Huh? Dad, why don't you reform? Reform who? Well, yourself. Say, you're smarter than any other man I ever met. Why, if we could settle down in one of these little towns and get a house all our own, why, you'd own the whole town and most of the farms around it in five years. You encourage me in the five-year plan? Oh, you know you could get it without stealing, too. Steal? Like Robin Hood, I take from the rich and give to the poor. Uh, what poor? Us poor. Oh, us poor is right. Oh, Dad, I'm so sick of it. I'd like able to be able sometime to look everybody straight in the face, and I'd scrub floors to do it. How could you look anyone straight in the face when you're scrubbing floors? Dear? Oh, Dad, please. We can't go on like this forever, just living from hand to mouth and sleeping in haystacks and dodging sheriffs. Go on, go on, taunt me. And when you see my emaciated body lying in the gutter, say to yourself, this is my work, and step over me. Oh, <laughs> darling, please forgive me. But those girls who passed us in that wagon, did you notice them? One tried to give me the office, but I played her for a chill. Oh. <laughs> they, they look so happy and so pretty. Poppy, someday I shall be rich. And you shall dress pretty, too. You shall have frocks and gowns of diaphanous silk. And you shall have a coach and four with gilded wheels. And flunkies and gold braids. Yes, and just how are you going to get all this? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. But where well, there's a will, there's a way. And the you have a part of me, dear, just a touch of liver. Dad, Dad, please listen to me. Oh, I know you mean well, but it isn't only for myself I want those things. It, it's for you, too. You want me to wear frocks? <laughs> no. And it doesn't have to be a gilded palace, either. Just, just a nice little place, something we can really call our own. You know, we've never had that. I know it hasn't always been easy for you, you know, bringing me up all by yourself, but, oh, gee, we can do better. We can, Dad, if you'll just make up your mind to us. Will you, Dad? Dad? Uh, fill him up, barkeep. Hash up yourself. Make wine scotch on rye. Oh, Dad. <laughs> Arrived at last, my 
dear. The green metal carnival, they call it. <laughs> yes, but we haven't any purple bark. You haven't got a concession, and we haven't a dime in our pockets. Don't change a thing, dear. Leave it all to me. Oh, gee, I'm so hungry. Hungry, my child? There's a place right over there. The sandwich stand? But, Dad, we haven't got any money. Quiet, child. Dad, listen, please. You can't get anything without not paying for it. Papaya, Where's the entrepreneur? Dad, please. Where is that fella, drop cat? Entrepreneur, my good man. Uh, good morning. Hello, service, please. Oh, sure. What'll it be? Uh, give me two of those luscious bologna sandwiches. Sandwich show de la chaise. Yeah, two dogs coming up. Dad, yeah. please. Do you have a double, dear? No, I don't want any. Oh, that's fine. Make it two doubles. All right, here you are. Thank that's 20 you. cents. Thank you. Will you have mustard poppy on? Some mustard, please. Yeah, it's right in front of you. That's uh, 20 cents for the dog. Ah, uh, right in front of me. Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, no mustard? Say, that's the best there is. If you don't like it, don't eat it. That's 20 cents. 20 cents. Is this leaf old? Is the horse really fresh? Of course it's fresh. That'll be 20 cents, eh? Uh. Oh, delicious. Fresh yeah. on this horse leaf, my pal. A little mayonnaise, my good man, and some uh, cranberry sauce, if you have it. And now listen, you horseradish, a mustard, a mayonnaise, a cranberry sauce, it's costing you 20 cents. 20 cents, huh? Yes, 20 cents. Ridiculously cheap. Very That's... reasonable. Remind me to pay you at the end of the engagement. No, no, you don't. You pay me right now. Wait here, mister. You can have mine back. Mine also. I refuse to do business with a man. You tramp, you've eaten the... more than half of them. How do you expect me to sell these now? Oh, first you insult me, then you ask my advice on salesmanship. Hello. Come, my little lad. Hey. Now you keep a civil tongue in your head, or you'll lose our trade. Come back here, you. You'll fork over that 20 cents, or I'll take it out of your hide. I'll help me, you yeah. yeah. I'll help yeah. me, sir. I'll crush every... Come on, shell out. You take your hands off him. Let him alone. He's ripping my coat. Let go of my coat. I'll let go of your coat when you give me that 20 cents. Oh, no, you fell it, Eric. Dad, Dad, what's the matter? Oh, I'll pay for this. Hey, what's the matter? I I didn't do nothing. What's eating you? Oh, it's broken my sacroiliac. Huh? Ah, ah, my sacroiliac's broken in six... What's the matter here? Break it up. Come on. What's the matter, Joe? This guy here, boss, he wouldn't pay for the dogs, and now, oh. now he says I broke his uh, celiac or something. Ah, the pain is excruciating. Shut up. Someone will pay for this and pay dearly. I told you to shut up. You know to whom you are addressing, man? I don't know who you are, but I happen to be the manager of this show. Manager, eh? Oh. Someone will pay for this, and I think I know who. All right, all right. How much do you want? Ah, uh, how much do I want, eh? Trying to bribe me. Ah, uh, very well. I'll take ten thousand dollars in the concession. I should charge you twenty thousand. I always was a nidget where business was concerned. I'll give you the concession and ten bucks. Take, take it or leave it. I'll take it. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Your booth is at the end of the midway. Now, no shell games, no gambling of any kind or description. The mayor of this town is a very fussy guy. No far fussier than I myself, I assure you. All right, you can take over the concession any time you want. Thank you, thank you. Very well, my little plum, it's just as I told you. Well, there's a will, there's a way. Good morning. Good morning. Ready to open up today? Yes, we're just mixing up a fresh batch of sarsaparilla. Can you please tell me where I could get a pail of water? Sure. There's a little stream right down the way. Let the pail down from the bridge. It's pretty clear right there. Well, thank you very much. Hey! Hey, look up! Hey! Get off the bridge! <laughs> Hey, you all right down there? You, you knocked me into the stream. <laughs> Gee, I'm terribly sorry. Don't you even speak to me. Shame on you trying to commit suicide at your age. Think of your old father and mother. Think of me. Yes, well, if I told you what I thought of you, I wouldn't be a lady. <laughs> Here, let me help you up. Don't you touch me. Riding a horse that way across a bridge, you must be crazy. Yes, ma'am. Come on. No, and stop grinning at me like a silly <laughs> ape. By the mirror, I bet you'd grin, too. Do you have brown eyes, or is that just mud? Why, you... <laughs> oh, gee, I guess I must look terrible. You know, I fell into a stream once. You know what I did? You went and dried off. That's right. Look, there's an old swimming hole about 100 yards downstream. We always hang our suits on a tree there. My sister sort of fit you. You slip into it, and I'll put the nag away and 
And I'll see you there in about ten minutes. All right? Well, all right. Swell. You can hang your dress up and let it dry out. See you soon. I've lived here all my life except for the time I was in college. Oh, gee, it must be nice living in a town like this, so quiet and peaceful. And then being able to come here whenever you want. I'd like that. Oh, it's so lovely here, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, funny, I never noticed it before. To me, it's just been the swimming hole. Now it's all changed somehow. <laughs> Your eyes aren't, eyes aren't brown, are they? They're blue. They're pretty, too. Well, thank you. I, I guess I ought to be getting back now. Hey, wait. I don't even know your name. It's Poppy. Poppy. Gee, that's beautiful. My name's Billy Farnsworth. My father's the mayor of this town. I'm his son. Well, that's a coincidence. (laughs) Thank you so much for bringing me here. Well, thanks for not being sore at me for pushing you off the bridge. Well, it wouldn't do me much good. Well, you could always sue, you know. Yes. The manager of the carnival was telling me about some old fake that tried to hold him up for 10,000 bucks yesterday. Claimed he broke his arm. You could try that if you wanted to. Could I? Sure, I'd love to be sued by you. Then I could see you every day in court. Maybe you'd find out I was a fake, too. Oh, excuse me. What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. I've just got to get back. Goodbye. Hey, Poppy, wait. Step right up, gentlemen. The fascinating scientific game of final fees. I move shells around the table so find the little pea and you win. Two'll get you four, four get you eight. A boy can play as well as a man, it's the old army came. Thirty cents says I can find the ball. Ah, the gentleman bets thirty cents. Plunger, take a choice. I say, let me see, it's under mm, the middle one. Left it up to see. Nope, it ain't. As I live and breathe. I thought you had me that time. I fooled myself. Here's your 30 cents. Thank you. Who'll be the next to out with me? The classic game is in the way of form of gambling. Hey. Game of hey. science. Hey, here comes the mayor. Yeah. What's that? The mayor, he's coming over here. Ah, oh, yes, my friends. I see him now. Yes, my friends, gambling is the root of all evil. And how will I know? Get those rid of those shells. Get them out of here, sir. Oh, yes, I was a victim of this horrible scourge. An unwilling pawn, caught in the toils of the Elzebub. Let it be a real little lesson to you. Lead us in song, Sister Wolfinger. Excuse me, sir. May I shake your hand, please? Oh, of course, of course, for sure. We need more men of your kind in these traveling carnivals, sir. Men with a real message. Huh? Men of steel. Steel, sir? Oh, I think, yes, you're right. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. I'm Mayor Farnsworth. Mayor, Your Honor, this is a surprise indeed. I am Dr. Eustace P. McGargle, F-A-S-N. Well, go right ahead with the lecture, Doctor. Sorry, I just finished. Half a ticket go. Are you remaining on the grounds all afternoon? No, no, I'm leaving at 4.30. How unfortunate. My next lecture won't start until about 4.32. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Uh, Dr. McGargle, I'd like you to meet Mrs. Tubbs. How do you do, Doctor? Mrs. Tubbs is one of our town's most solid citizens. Ah, uh, she looks at I mean, uh, how do you do? How do you do? <laughs> I heard part of your talk, Doctor, and I think it was just thrilling. I wish you'd come and call on me sometime. Oh, I'd be delighted. Oh, thank you. Shall we go on, Mayor? Oh, uh, wait, Sarah. I want you to meet Dr. McGargle also. Uh, Dr. McGargle, this is Mrs. Sarah Brown. How do you do? How do you do? Mrs. Brown is a great moral leader in our community. Oh, a woman after my own heart. I hope not. <laughs> very good, very good, Sarah. Shall we go? Uh, yes. Uh, well... Good night, Doctor, and good luck. Oh, thank you, thank you, man. Keep up the good work. Ah, uh, thank you. Scarcely have left the grounds before I shall be hard at it again. Good night, Doctor. <laughs> Don't forget, you're going to take me round the carnival. Oh, I'll take you, yes. You bet I will. Uh, <laughs> she's all dressed up like a well-kept grave. Ten cents says I can guess what shell is under. You still here? Go away. My name's Whiffin. What a pretty name. Go away, you draw flies. Well, gee whiz, all right. Wait a minute. Who is that fat lady with just here? 
That's Mrs. Tubbs. She's a widow. Kind of dumb, I always thought. I just wanted to check on my judgment. Good day, Mr. Whiffin. Of course, she's uh, pretty rich. Who's rich? Mrs. Tubbs. Got her hands on most of the money in this town. Is that so? Yep, it was left to her in a wheel. In a wheel, eh? Yep, second cousin or something left it to her in a wheel. That's very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Very interesting. Widow, eh? Yep. Widow. Yeah. You, uh, thinking of something? Yes, yes, I was, oh. yeah. As an old blind aunt of mine used to say, where there's a will, there's prosperity just around the corner. We've come to the intermission in our Lux Radio Theater. In just a moment, we'll go on with Act Two of Poppy, starring W.C. Fields and Anne Shirley. Now for our Between the Acts parlor game. Tonight, we have a couple of tongue twisters for you to try. We've asked two of the young ladies here in the Lux Radio Theater to try their luck, and they're right here beside me now. They think they're up to any tongue twisters we've got. Are you? Our first contestant is Miss Eleanor James, now of Hollywood, who came here from 1304 Paxton Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio. Miss James... Let's hear you say this three times. No wrinkles rankle like ankle wrinkles rankle. 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 That's fine. But here's a wrinkle for every woman who is embarrassed by stockings that have that droopy look around the ankle. When you wash your stockings in Lux Flakes, they keep their shape and fit because they retain elasticity. For real stocking flattery, use Lux every time. And by way of thanking you, Miss James, there's a big economical box of Lux. Oh, thank you very much. And now for our second volunteer. She's Mrs. William Parker of Hollywood, who formerly lived at 615 Powell Street, San Francisco. Mrs. Parker, see if you can say this three times. Lux's luxurious, lustrous suds leave long-lasting elasticity. 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 (laughs) That's not so bad. Lux's luxurious, lustrous suds leave long-lasting elasticity. When you use strong soap on your stockings, you weaken their elasticity. Rubbing with cake soap does this, too. But Lux saves elasticity, so stockings can give instead of breaking so often into runs. And now, Mrs. Parker... Here's a big box of Lux Flakes with our compliments. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. We continue with Puppy, starring W.C. Fields and Anne Shirley. It's early the same evening, and Professor McGoggle has gone a-wooing. On the doorstep of Mrs. Tubbs' comfortable house, he adjusts his purple brocaded vest, flourishes a tattered handkerchief at his dusty shoes, and raps smartly on the door. Dropping, 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 hear those pennies fall. Everyone's for the professor, he will get them all and more too. What's the matter here? Everybody dead? Ah, good evening, Mademoiselle Shrubs. Why, Dr. McCargle, what a pleasant surprise. Oh, come in, please. Thank you. Well, oh, go right in the parlor, Dr. McCargle. Welcome to my modest little cottage. Oh, quite a charming lean-to you have here. <laughs> Reminds me of my wiki up on the Magogo River. <laughs> Tributary to Lake Titicaca. Would you sit down, please? Oh, well, thank you. I hope you'll pardon my intruding at this hour, Mrs. Flubs. Tubbs. Tubbs. Tubbs, yes, thank you. Ah, well, I came on a mission of utmost delicacy. Oh, uh, something to do with charity, no doubt. Well, yes, and no, and no. Nevertheless, uh, I'm ashamed to come empty-handed. I had fully intended to bring you a basket of hollyhocks, but I couldn't uh, steal a buy up. Um, they're out of season. I didn't want to bring you canned, Hollyhock. <laughs> oh, of course, I understand. Let me take your hand. Oh, no trouble. I'll put it right here. Oh! Oh, what a 
Clumsy chap and eight I am. I'm afraid I've broken your lovely bar. Oh, it's all right. It's just some of the water spilling on the family all. Now, here, let me dry it off. Oh, water fades pictures, so it's horrid. Oh. Uh, do you like water? A little on the side. Oh, I mean, um... <laughs> give it to me, give it to me. I'll dry it. Oh, oh. Ah, the page is, uh, this one's loose. And this came out right by hand. <laughs> oh, well, it really doesn't matter. Oh, you're too kind, Mrs. Dub. I shall take this picture along with me and have a new print made the first opportunity. Oh, but you really don't have to. Oh, say no more. Dismiss it. It's good as done. <laughs> oh, well, if you insist. <laughs> oh, I'm rather proud of my album, you know. As such an old family. Yes, so I see. <laughs> Are you interested in family albums, they Dr. McCardle? They are the McCardle? fondest things I am of. <laughs> there are some very interesting things in this one. I'm sure. Well, 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 well. John L. Sullivan. Oh, no, no. This is my old Aunt Anna. Isn't she sweet? Oh. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. She's very quaint. What biceps. What a beezer. <laughs> Oh, this is this, look, 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 this one here. The man with the beard. What's that? Well, of all things, if it isn't Cockeyed Mulligan. <laughs> I don't know who Mr. Cockeyed Mulligan is, Dr. Oh. McCargle, but this is a picture of my husband. Oh, oh is that so? Oh, yeah, oh, what a fine-looking old codger he is, too. I hope you pardon the mistake, Mrs. Dub. I could fuse you with a man who used to work with me, uh, worked for me, rather, in the silver mine, gold and platinum mines I had up at Cohen's Gulf. What? Hell, Mulligan, the old stew. Finest fellow I will ever live. He's hung before his time. He died before his time. Died young. Oh, oh uh, did you say you own gold and platinum mines? Oh, did I? Yes, it might have slipped out. Oh, well, mind. that's very interesting. Yeah, I always thought so myself. And that's one of the things that brought me here tonight. Really? Yes. Mrs. Nubbs, <laughs> when a man has spent his life at hard work, did I ever tell you the story of how Mulligan and I pardoned here? Oh. Dove off an escarpment of frigid ice into the Winnemucca River, each with a canoe under his arm. Oh, how brave. When we approached the opposite shore, we were confronted by 10, 20, 50,000 Skagway Indians. Oh. There they stood with their tomahawks raised high above their heads. Oh. Mulligan and I unsheathed our bowie knives and cut a path through this wall of human flesh. Dragging our canoes behind us. Oh, marvelous. Well, marvelous. anyway, yeah, nothing really. When a man has amassed his share of this world's goods, his heart turns to things of a more spiritual nature. He dreams of peace and security and a mellow old age in the company of... <laughs> yes. The woman I love. Oh, Dr. McCargo. <laughs> Mrs. Trump, has anyone told, ever told you you were beautiful? <laughs> well, uh, yes. <laughs> I knew they had. <laughs> I knew they'd beat me to it. I knew it. <laughs> oh, no, no, but wait. Before you go any further, Doctor, I think I ought to tell you. Huh? I shall never marry again. Oh, you won't, eh? <laughs> After leading me on. What? You can't take a man's heart and tear it to shreds. Why? Making me look like a knave in the eyes of the world. Oh. Me with a grown daughter. Oh, the answer. Why, it's a clear case of breach of promise. What? Women, I... women, women. A mere oh. pawn in the clutches of an adventurer. Oh, the idea. Oh, Dr. McCardle, I... I... <laughs> Yes, sir, Professor, that's mighty fine stuff you got there, and mighty fine of you to invite me over, too. Oh, no, 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 here, have another lager. Uh, sure, uh, Mr. Whiffin, uh, drink deep of the brimming uh, bowl. It's kind of hot, ain't it? Yeah, it hurts your purple box, asparella, my own private batch. Ninety-eight percent spirits for menti, two percent sweetener. We're talking about Mrs. Mubbs, I believe. You mean Mrs. Tubbs, yes. She yeah. has plenty of money, though it ain't rightfully hers. It isn't there. How come? Well, the whole caboodle of this estate belongs to Catherine Putnam, if she can be found. Oh, missing heiress, eh? Yep, been gone for 20 years, ever since she fussed with her father. She ran off with the circus. 
That left uh, Mrs. Kin, the, you know, Mrs. Tubbs, next of kin. Oh, millions molding in the bank, eh? I'd like to do something for that poor, unfortunate soul. If I get my hands on that money, I could double it in a fortnight. If you could get your hands on it, but nobody can, but nobody's going to either until they find out what's become Mrs. Catherine Putnam and her daughter. Daughter, eh? Yep, she had a baby. Uh, how old would you be about now? Oh, let me see now. Figure times figure is figure three times. Eighteen, the best of my recollection. Eighteen, eh? Just about Poppy's age. That's right. And if that daughter, Catherine Putnam's daughter, if she could be found, she'd inherit the whole estate, eh? Yep. Thinking of uh, something? Yeah, no, of course. Uh, no. Well, good night, friend. And I think I can call you my friend. Oh, no, you don't. You're figuring on something. Uh, I can read you like a book. And if I was you, I wouldn't try to pass off my daughter as Catherine Putnam, unless I had expert advice. Am I in? My dear man. Am I in? Do you suppose I would try to prove that I married Catherine Putnam? Do you suppose I would try to fake a marriage certificate? Do you suppose I would say that my daughter is not my own flesh and blood, but Catherine Putnam's daughter? Do you suppose I would do all this for the sake of filthy lucre? Yes, I do. Oh, all right, then. You're in. <laughs> what do you say, Poppy? Once around again? All right. I'll get the brass ring this time. Then we've got to get off. I want to speak to you, Poppy. All right, Billy. Fun, Billy. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Fun. A girl like you been around carnivals all your life, and you still get a kick out of a wooden horse. I can't understand it. Well, I, I guess I feel like you did. You know about the swimming hole. Oh, I never knew it was such fun before. Poppy, you've forgiven me, haven't you? Well, you know, for what I said the other day about... Oh, of course I have. You didn't know, and, well, anyway, I guess part of it's true. No, but it isn't. Why... Well, he's a swell guy. Oh, he is a swell guy. Poppy, do you still feel the same? I mean about, well, wanting to settle down in a little town like this. Well, I guess so. Why? Well, well, I could fix it. You? Sure. But how? Well, all you have to do is just stay here. Stay here and marry me. Billy! Oh, oh but you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do. I mean it. It just struck me all of a sudden, Poppy, but honest, I mean it, like I never meant anything in my life. Oh, Billy, you're so sweet, but... Oh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't leave Dad to go roaming all over the country by himself. You know, he's getting an awful lot of trouble without me. No. Oh. Well, then it's hopeless, huh? I'm afraid so. Yeah, well, it's a good idea. Billy, look, maybe someday... What? Maybe someday we'll come back this way, and if I do, and if things are different... Well, they may be different. You never can tell. Oh, sure you can, Poppy. Poppy, would you give me something to keep until you do come back? I know it sounds silly, but I really want it. All right. I'll give you the only thing I've got, Billy. I know it isn't much, but it's something. Here. It's this locket. I've had it ever since I was a kid. It's only a baby's locket, but, well, it's gold anyway. Oh, thanks, Poppy. <laughs> Right up here, Mayor, the professor's temporary quarters. You say you're positive that Dr. McGargle was married to Catherine Putnam after she left home? That's right, Mayor. Hmm. Sounds awful fishy to me. Here we are. Good morning, Doctor. Ah, Mr. Whiffin, good morning. Dr. McGargle, I brought Mayor Farnsworth to see you. Oh, Your Honor, I trust you're fit this apology day, am. Good morning, Doctor. Mayor Farnsworth wants to ask you a few questions. Oh, proceed, Your Honor. Uh, yes. Doctor, what was your wife's maiden name? Uh, my wife. You refer to Catherine? No, 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 no. The family name. Was it by any chance Putnam? I'll be candid with you, Mayor. It was. <laughs> but she rarely used it. The misunderstanding in the family. Mayor Farnsworth is the sole trustee of the Putnam estate. That's so. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. Mr. Whiffen tells me your wife passed away several years ago. Yes, poor dear. She was killed in Upper Sandusky. Run over by a pie wagon. <laughs> One of those hit and gallop away drivers. 
One of the horses, the gray mare, sway back, Dave. Oh, Never mind the horse. The describe your wife. His name is... Huh? Huh? Oh, yes, my little pride of yesteryear, pardon me. My pigeon, my little kitty pie. Uh, what was her approximate weight? Well, she fought as a weather welterweight. At, uh, or, um, um, <laughs> she, uh, uh, she varied from time to time. She dieted frequently, you know. You'd have to catch her on the scale. Well, what was her average weight? Average weight, let me see, let me see. See, it's just slipped my mind for the nonce. Well, was it 100 pounds, 200 pounds? <coughs> uh, what did you say, uh, Mr. Whitman? Nothing. Got a little cough, that's all. Oh. <coughs> Try some of this pine tar elixir. Your cough intrigues me. Well, well, Dr. McGargle, 100 or 200? <coughs> I would say offhand, one or 200 pounds. <laughs> I never watched her closely on the scale. Well, 100 pounds seems to check. Now, uh, tell me, what about her height? Oh, you mean, um, you mean how tall was she? Yes. Oh. Yes, now let me see, let me see. Uh, your mind works so quickly, man. <coughs> What's this? What? Uh, nothing, 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 Your Honor. Let me see now, how tall was she? <coughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. She was eight feet tall. Eight feet? Uh, eight feet. Pardon me, pardon me. Pardon me. Now, this is all very distressing. I was thinking of a piece of land I bought, eight by 16, up in Cucamonga. Had a very fine view of the ocean. Well, well, how tall was she? Uh, <coughs> I got you. <laughs> I got you that time. Uh, she was five feet three inches in her silk stocking, fraction shorter in her bare feet, of course. Hmm. Yes. Well, we've been searching for Catherine Putnam for years now. You see, Doctor, if Catherine died without leaving any children, the whole estate goes to Mrs. Tubbs. Oh, yes, Mrs. Tubbs. But you have a daughter, Doctor. True. Potential heiress to my vast copper interests on the shores of Lake Titicaca. High up in the Andes. Uh, tell me, Doctor, had your wife any distinguishing marks? Any birthmarks? Birthmarks, birthmarks. Uh, no, no, she never slept in a berth. She preferred the smoking room. We always played blackjack for chewing tobacco. Uh-huh. Catherine Putnam had a mole on her left ear. I uh, did, eh? Yes, he did. Ah, that was when you knew her. I removed it later with purple fox sarsaparilla. Oh, Oh, I see. Well, have you any other proofs? Nothing at all. Oh, yes. I have a photograph of her taken in her teens in the mud bath of the manor, by the manor house up at Punxsutawney. Now, where did I put that? She loved those mud baths. I had that around here for after Miss Lady. Oh, what's this? Oh, here it is. This our marriage license, which, of course, can be of no interest to anyone. What? Let me see that. Careful, please. A marriage license. Doctor, do you know the value of this document? Only that it is very near and dear to me. By this, your daughter becomes the heiress to the Putnam fortune. You overwhelmed me. What a coincidence that I should have carried it all these years. And now it serves to bring more untold wealth and happiness to my little plum. I congratulate you, Doctor. Your daughter is a very lucky girl. Thank you. You've been a great help, Your Honor. I've always known that someone come along to claim the Putnam fortune, but I've always been afraid of imposters. Thieves. No, oh, thieves. Uh, <laughs> terrible creatures. I avoid them like I do whiskey. No, oh, we would have caught anyone who, who tried it. Yes, sir. <laughs> We'd have given them 20 years at hard labor. I know you might catch them all right. But the hard labor would be a bit difficult, I'm afraid. That's right. <laughs> but we've been spared that, Dr. McGargle. I'm very happy for all concerned. Yes, the Putnam fortune is in good hands. I'm sure of it. Well, I'll go and see about transferring the estate. Oh, good, day. Thank you. good day, Your Honor. Good day. What a man. What a brain. If any. <laughs> Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
We've lowered the curtain on the second act of Pape. Before starting Act Three, we spend this short intermission with a real-life character from the big tops and sawdust circles, such as we encounter in Pape. Our guest is Miss Margaret Graham, wardrobe mistress of the Al G. Bond Sells Floto Circus. Now, if I were visiting you, Miss Graham, in your tent at the circus, instead of you visiting us in the Lux Radio Theater, would you take me for a rube? Yes, Mr. DeMille, because you'd probably ask me the four questions everybody asks anybody with a circus. Where did you come from? Where do you go from here? How long does an elephant live? And why are performing horses always white? And what would be your answers? Well, I came from winter quarters at the Barnes Park, Baldwin Park, California. In three weeks, we leave on our tour, and we don't stop moving until the last of October. <laughs> an elephant lives <coughs> to be about 100, because that's as good an answer as any. And horses are white, because white doesn't show the rosin, sprinkled on the back, of course, to keep the riders from slipping. <coughs> what else would you like to know? <laughs> that's, that's all satisfactory except the age of the elephant. Now, uh, how did you join the circus? Well, I started off with the Wild West show of Buffalo Bill as a rider way back in 1911. But my riding days are over, and I've sort of settled down to the less hazardous occupation of wardrobe. No, less hazardous, perhaps, but equally interesting, I'm sure. Tights and spangles have spelled circus since time immemorial. There's a lot more to it than tights and spangles, Mr. DeMille. When the circus gets to town, I have my own wagon drawn by four elephants to bring the costumes from the train to the wardrobe tent. We can't take any risks of costumes not being ready or not looking exactly right. And that's why I won't let anything but Lux Flake and water touch our fine suits and dresses and Spanish laces. And I'm not the only one who uses Lux either. It's part of a circus tradition that every trapeze artist furnish her own silk tights. They're very fussy about tights, and tights are very fussy things themselves. And if you would like into my wardrobe tent any night after the show is over. You see those high-paid girls washing their own tights in Lux Flake. They won't let me do it for them. A bit finicky, oh. eh? Well, it's one of the circus customs, and believe me, we have plenty of them. You're not superstitious, Miss Graham. Not superstitious, just careful. For example, I'd never think of whistling in a dressing room because that would mean that the girl whose trunk is nearest the entrance would get fired. What happens if you hadn't intended to whistle but suddenly found out that you had? I'd get out of the tent as fast as I could, turn around three times, and then come in. That makes everything all right again. I see. <laughs> Not superstitious, just careful. Any other things that are bad? Plenty. For example, in a circus, no one in a circus would dream of playing a harmonica. That means an accident. This year, Joe, our trained chimpanzee, is going to play the harmonica in a new act, and while he isn't human, he's close enough to have all pretty much on edge. You'll never see a yellow costume worn on a Friday. Any other day, it's all right, but on Friday, it's just begging for bad luck, and nobody traveling with a circus would think of owning one of those old-fashioned camelback trunks. What's wrong with a camelback trunk? They're a sure sign that we'll have bad weather all season, and if a newcomer does know... Why, anybody has a perfect right to throw the trunk off the train. And now, Mr. DeMille, let me wish you and Lux Radio Theater red days with plenty of straw and no dookie runs. Well, thank you, but what does that mean? Red days with plenty of straw means nice weather and a full house, and no dookie runs means that you'll always come in according to schedule. In other words, the best of luck. Thank you, Miss Graham. Thank you. And plenty of straw to you. Now for the third act of Poppy with W.C. Fields and Anne Shirley. The news of Poppy's good fortune has spread rapidly around the town. On the strength of the wealth that will soon be his daughter's, the professor has blossomed forth in a beautiful new pea green suit. As he strolls down the main street, he's greeted by admirers on every side. <laughs> Morning, Professor. Morning, my good man. Morning, Doctor. Morning, doctor. friend. Uh, planning to fix up the Putnam estate much, Professor? Somebody uh, said you was figuring on selling it. Yeah, what about it, Doc? Gentlemen, I have already granted the Green Meadow Gazette a full interview on all matters pertaining to my daughter's inheritance. Therefore, I should not care to make any premature oral announcement for fear of misquoting myself. But I may tell you 
There will be a formal dance and clam bake and possibly a baseball well, game at the Putnam right. House in the very near future to celebrate my daughter's newfound wealth. And you are invited one and all. Try to get in. Hey, Professor, I want to see you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Whippin. Sorry I'm in such a hurry. May be able to squeeze you in for a few moments later on in the season. Oh, you know you don't, Professor. I said I wanted to speak to you, and I'm a-going to. And I said, Mr. Whippin, that I was in a hurry. You ain't been in such a hurry to let me have some of that money you've been owing me for the last uh, week or so, you know. Get my hands on it. Oh, quiet, quiet. I'll see you some other time. No, you'll see me right now. And if you don't, I'll publish your double dealings all over this community. Shut up, I tell you. Shut up. If there's been any double dealings, my friend, I dare say you've had your finger in it. You hold on. Yeah, watch up, Doc. Yeah, what's the matter? And if you annoy me further, I should summons a constable. Oh, no, you won't. Cease. Or I shall smite you upon the sconce with his truncheon. You lug. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Make a day of it. Oh, Billy, I still can't believe it. It isn't true. It can't be. <laughs> well, if it isn't, you're certainly feeding the whole town for nothing. Look at them. They'll have that blue face supper cleaned up before it's even time to dance. Oh, well, let them. I want them to be happy, too. Just as happy as I am. You've got everything you want, Papa. Oh, more than everything, Billy. But, you know, I don't want to take it all. I want to give half to Mrs. Tubbs. But, Poppy, I no, don't... No, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't. Good evening, Poppy. Oh, Mrs. Brown. How are you, Billy? I'm fine, I'm sir. I'm so glad you could come, Mrs. Brown. Do you think I'd miss it, my dear? I've been a friend of Billy's too long to miss the announcement of his engagement. Sure. Engagement? Oh, dear, I, I suppose I've let the cat out of the bag again. You certainly have. Poppy, your father's going to announce our engagement tonight. You don't mind, do you? Mind? Of course she doesn't. You're getting a fine boy, Poppy. And he's getting a very sweet girl. Oh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as Mayor of Green Meadows, it is my privilege at this time to introduce to you a man who needs no introduction. I give you that great entertainer, that kindly and lovable character... Dr. Eustace P. McGargle, F-A-S-S. I thank you. I thank you, I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I shall play for you this evening the first motive of the Dujiji from the opera Schreckensmatz by Gilke Kimmel and Ossip P. Bedapo on my beloved Kadula Kadula. But before I do, before I do, I want to introduce to you the model of the scientific age, Purple Park Sarsaparilla. Oh, yeah. Dad, uh, Dad, no. Oh, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, dear. I beg your pardon, I'm off from time. What a poor pardon. Uh, uh. <laughs> Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very important announcement. Soon, ladies and gentlemen, in this very room in which you stand, two of the oldest families in Indiana will be joined by a wedlock. I refer to the family Farnsworth and the house of McGarver. Stop, stop it, I say. Yeah, what's, what's the matter? What's the matter? Who, who's the, who are you? What's the matter? What's the matter with me? Mr. Whippin, what's the meaning of this? Uh, Your Honor, before this goes any further, I want you to know that this man, the father of the girl who's to be your daughter-in-law, is one of the biggest swindlers that ever come down the pike. What's that? The man's mad. He's a dildar. It belongs in the nut bag. Mr. Whiffin, you'll have to support those remarks. I'll support them, all right. You got that marriage certificate he gave you? Yeah, right here in my pocket. Well, take a look at it. That certificate is a forgery. What? Oh, yeah, but I can prove it. He claims this paper was made out in 1863. You see that watermark there? Plain as the bones in your hand, 1881. Oh, I've been framed. I've been swindled. Get a lawyer. Dr. McGargle, explain this at once. I shall explain it. Have no fear. <laughs> I shall have my attorney here first thing in the morning. Happy? Take it on the lamp. Stop that man. Poppy, Poppy. Oh. oh, don't cry, Poppy. Let me alone, please. Run along, Billy. I'll take care of her. Come, Poppy. You're going home with me. Poppy, dear, don't cry anymore. And don't worry about him. He'll be all right. 
Oh, they never made an arrest in this town except by mistake. Oh, why did he do it? Why? Oh, I guess he just didn't know any better. But he does. He's smart, really. Honest, he is. Hmm. Who's that? No, I'll answer it. You stay here. Ah, uh, good evening, Miss Brown. You. Oh, Dad. Uh, may I step in for a moment? Yes, get in before somebody sees you. Oh, Dad. Dad, I was so worried. You came back for me. Yes, to say goodbye, my baby. I have been looting the local band of assassins all evening. I saw the light in this modest cottage, and looking in the window, I spied you, my little plum. Oh, Dad, please, you've got to hide. What'll you do if they find you? About 20 years. <laughs> if you're lucky. Quite true. Oh, Dad, you can't. You've got to get away now. Come on, dear, I'll go with you. No, my baby, you must stay here. But I don't want to. I want to be with you. You're my father. My plum... I can't lie to you any longer. I'm not your father. What? No, my baby. Oh, oh, Dad, you're lying. You don't know what you're saying. It's the truth. I found you with a circus when you were three years old. Listen, the bloodhounds are on us. I must go. Oh, but, Dad... Here, my plum. I empty my pockets for you. Take this worldly goods, three dollars in cash, the shell game, and some private paper. They're all I have. Dad, Dad, you can't leave now. I must, dear. Goodbye, my plum, and bless you. And one word of fatherly advice before I go. Yes, Dad. Poppy, never give a sucker an even break. <laughs> if you ever wish to join me, telegraph me in case of the Ice Palace, Montreal. Oh, he's gone, and I'll never see him again. Poppy, dear, perhaps it's all for the best. Oh, no, how can you say that? Oh, I don't care if he was my real father or not. He's the only one I've ever known. Well, he didn't leave you very much, my dear. A shell game. That'll be a help. And a photograph. Ooh, looks like it's been torn out of some album. Poppy, what is this? What? This picture. Where did he get it? I don't know. Do you know who this is? It's a picture of Catherine Putnam. And that's her little girl right there, see? She was just a baby. Well, are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure. I'd know Catherine Putnam. She was one of my best friends. And that little locket around the baby's neck, I gave it to her at her christening. Why, I have a locket like that. Where? I gave it to Billy. It's shaped just like this one. Wait. Did you... Did you open it? Well, open it? I didn't know it opened. There's a picture in it. A picture of Catherine Putnam's baby. It was cut down from this one here. If the picture in that locket is the same as this one... Then if it is... Oh, come on, quick. Where are we going? We've got to find the mayor. And we've got to find Billy. And we've got to find that locket. And here's the picture. He had it in his pocket, Mayor. Where he got it, I don't know. Hmm. That's Catherine Putnam, all right. And that's her baby. Now, wait, Billy. Billy, have you got that locket? Here it is. Open it, Billy. Give it to me. Look. The picture in the locket. It's the same as the other. Then... Oh, you are Catherine Putnam's daughter and the rightful owner of the estate. This proves it beyond a doubt. Go on inside, Professor. Huh? Unhand me, unhand me, you flat-footed gilded sleeve, or I'll kick you in the chin. Dad! I got him, Mayor. He tried to escape on a stolen horse. It was my horse he stole. Oh, Dad, what happened? The fortunes of war, my plum. I never did think much of that horse. And he dropped dead right in front of the police station. <laughs> Mayor, Mayor, you've got to release him right now. Of course, of course, my dear. Uh, Constable, take those handcuffs off of him. What? Go on, go on. You can't arrest a man for stealing a dead horse. Certainly not. What's the matter? Is everybody crazy? Oh, Dad, listen. Darling, I've got the most wonderful news for you. I'm really an heiress. Uh, sure. You're getting smart now. No. No. <laughs> Dad, look. I'm really Catherine Putnam's daughter. We just proved it. Why, Catherine? Why... Of course you are, my plum. I knew it all along. Then why didn't you say so? If you remember, my dear fellow, I did say so, and you're going to give me 20 years. Well, I must say goodbye. Goodbye? What for? The carnival is moving, dear, and I'm moving with it. Oh, oh no, Dad, no. Yeah, there's no place for me here, but I'll come and see you, if I may. I shall come on Sundays for chicken dinner. Dad, please, we want you to live with us. No, my plum, not a word. This is where you belong, my little baby. You'll be happy. And I could never feel happy or natural unless there was a copper at least a hundred yards behind me. 
Oh, Dad, I love you. I love you, Poppy. Goodbye, my little plum. <laughs> That is the end of Puppy. Mr. Fields and Miss Shirley will rejoin us presently. Meanwhile, Melville Roick wants to give you another of his strange but true facts, Mr. Roick. Do you know that the average mother, according to a recent estimate, washes nearly 28,000 dishes and over 26,000 pieces of silver every year? More than 54,000 pieces. And that's just for the three regular meals every day. It doesn't include any special meals or entertaining, nor cooking utensils and dishes used around the kitchen. Now, that's a lot of dishes to wash every year. And your hands are bound to suffer if you aren't careful about the soap you use. Yet thousands of women who do their own dishwashing keep their hands lovely and soft. They use Lux Flakes because they've found Lux gives them a real dishpan beauty treatment. Lux is so gentle that it doesn't dry the beauty oils that keep hands young-looking and beautiful. Why not begin right away to use Lux for your dishes? Buy Lux Flakes tomorrow. Be sure to get the large box it's even more economical that way. Now, Mr. DeMille. Ladies and gentlemen, in this ring you are about to witness one of the most dazzling and electrifying exhibits ever countenanced by man. It is known to science as the Probatus Fieldsium, and to the world in general as the nose that launched a thousand quits. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, accompanied by W.C. Fields and Anne Shirley. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, but let's be informal. Um, just please call me Whitey. Did you ever really travel with a circus? Oh, yes, Anne. I once lent my services to a peregrinating mountebank. I was with him for a brief sabbatical. It made me valet de charme to the elephant. <laughs> you mean you, you packed its trunk? Yes, I'll never forget my first day under the big top. The wardrobe mistress... Handed me a uniform, a dazzling creation of red and gold. The gold was counterfeit. <laughs> Did it fit you, Mr. Fields? It fit me fine, Mr. DeMille, but it required every ounce of strength in my frame to get it on that elephant. Her name was Gertrude. <laughs> go on, go on, please. What happened then? I recall one beautiful afternoon as I was sitting in front of Gertrude's stall when a little nipper ambled up, a child, Annie, with a bag of peanuts. The little wretch pointed at my nose and said, Look, Mama... This elephant talks. <laughs> Did my nose turn, my face turn red? <laughs> but, Mr. Fields, don't you know that anything washed in Lux never changes color? Might I recommend that you dip your trunk, I mean nose, excuse uh, me, <laughs> into a noggin of those beautiful Lux suds? Madam, do you too wish to impugn my honor? I shall be heckled no more, Mr. DeMille. I bid you good night. Gargle like a true McSpoken. Oh, I mean spoken like a true McGargle. <laughs> good night, Mr. DeMille, and thank you. Good night, Anne. Good night, Professor McGargle. <laughs> to our stage next Monday night comes the exciting two-fisted drama of a man's fight for power and wealth. Force is the only law he respects. By force, he wins success and a wife. By force, he loses both until he finally learns that there's another law in life called love. Our play is titled The Boss. It was written by Edward Sheldon and proved a great hit on Broadway. It brings back to our microphone three superb Hollywood artists, Edward Arnold, Faye Ray, and H.B. Warner. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward Arnold... Kay Ray and H.B. Warner in The Boss. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Heard in our play tonight was Keith Gallagher as Griffin, John Payne as Billy Fontworth, Helen DeGrant as Mrs. Tubbs, Lou Merrill as Mayor Fontworth, Gretchen Thomas as Sarah Brown, and W.L. Thorne as manager of circuit. Louis Silvers appeared for courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for the new picture Sally, Irene, and Mary. John Payne will be seen shortly in the Paramount film, College Swing. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.